So remember who appoints the justices. Countries appoint the justices. So when Lebanon appoints a justice, it's Hezbollah's appointing the justice. The International Court of Justice <laughs> is an ill- Yeah! <laughs> Hezbollah justices. Hezbollah judges, dude. Hamas judges. Legitimate court. It is Today, my two guests are scholars with deeply opposing views and a feud that's well documented has its own Wikipedia page. But they've agreed to debate with us uh -huh. uh, today with me over the ideas, I love this. not the individuals. Author and political scientist, Professor Norman Finkelstein, and the lawyer and author of War Against the Jews and former Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz. Well, welcome to both of you. Um, I thought we'd start uh, this because it's, it's something that comes up all the time where people say to me, it didn't start on October the 7th. And of course, I realize that the conflict uh, between Israel and the Palestinians is not something that began just a few months ago. Um, and you could argue it goes back thousands of years, but I'm not going to get into that part of the argument. What, what? I want to do is take as a starting point for the modern era of conflict, so 75 years, of 1947, when the UK turned the Palestine problem over to the United Nations, who decided to split Palestine into two different countries. Let's take that as the catalyst for what has followed in the next 75 years. And what I want to do is give each of you... Wasn't this guy all over the Epstein dogs? Why, yes, that is esteemed tenured Harvard professor, um, and of course, more famously, Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer, Alan Dershowitz, a defender of not only Jeffrey Epstein and O.J. Simpson, but also a defender on the, according to him, the constitutionality argument of lowering the age of consent. That right there is Alan Dershowitz, of course. Now, one must ask themselves, why is it that every single fucking weirdo at the start, two minutes or so, to just outline what you think happened at the start that has basically been the catalyst for what follows. So, Norman Finkelstein, let me start with you. Just outline from 1947. That's the only reason why they can get, like, dudes who got banned off of fucking Twitch, people like Divorcelli, kick streamers like Divorcelli, and the likes of Alan Dershowitz. Quite difficult to find a normal person with a conscience to defend the unjustifiable acts of Israel, especially nowadays. It's funny, because, like, it's not like there aren't liberal Zionists out there. There are plenty of liberal Zion is out there to be fair to the Dersh, Israel will literally be the only place he can hop on to on a jet to if he gets criminally implicated in the Epstein stuff or any underage sex stuff he's definitely involved in allegedly allegedly involved in we were not going to say definitely okay very litigious man But like I was saying, there are obviously like telegenic liberal Zionists out there. Why the fuck aren't they defending Israel is a question you might be asking yourself. And that's because, well, yeah, it's currently incredibly indefensible. They know how to read the fucking room. They recognize that there is no defense for Israel's atrocities, uh, which are slated to only get worse. Judging by what Israel has done so far. So those guys at least want to be able to preserve their media careers and, uh, you know, and be able to, to show their faces in public. If you're Alan Dershowitz, you don't care about that sort of thing anyway, because you are a ghoul and people oftentimes, uh, oftentimes, oftentimes react to your face with, ah, and disgust. So he's the perfect guy to do it. What happened then that you believe created really the problem that followed? I think the problem that followed can be very easily summarized by two statements of the chief Israeli historian, Benny Morris. Statement number one, he said in his comprehensive history of the conflict, he states, one, that the fear of Arab displacement and dispossession was the chief motor of Arab resistance to Zionism. His second statement is the idea of transfer, which is what the euphemism for expulsion, the idea of transfer was inbuilt and inevitable in Zionism. That to me is the starting point. The fear 
the rational fear of the Palestinian people that should the Zionist idea be realized, it would result in their territorial dispossession and displacement. It's no different than the fear of our own, meaning the U.S., Native Americans, that the success of the Euro-American enterprise in the United States would be at the expense of our Native population. The fear, the rational fear, of territorial displacement and dispossession. OK, that's very clear. Alan Dershowitz, would you actually disagree with that in terms of an assessment of how this made Palestinians feel? And were they wrong to feel it? I wouldn't just... <clears throat> Uh, yes, uh, and, and yes, uh, I, they felt uh, they were wrong to feel it. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, yes, I do disagree with that. Anyway, um, I love that there was a chatter in here. It was like, N-word manifesto, context, please. Brother, no amount of context is going to help you understand the world like that, Okay. That world is is uh, indecipherable if you are even a little bit normal. Like, you might spend every goddamn waking moment of your life online, and that will still be fucking impossible to, to contend with. Just a lot of dudes out there online that love the notion, the idea, the freedom for white men to be able to say the N-word. It's like the most important thing for them. I have to go back just 10 years earlier. 1947-48, the Peel Commission was set up by Great Britain. It recommended dividing the mandate into a tiny little sliver of land uh, along the Mediterranean for a Jewish state where there was a Jewish majority, and the Jewish majority would what? determine how that was governed. Uh, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the leader of the Palestinian people, said, rejected it. He said there's no such thing as the Palestinians. We're just greater Arabs, and, uh, and, and we don't want there to be a Palestinian state. We just want there not to be a, a Jewish state. And then in 1948... Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, the the Grand Mufti was like, "We, I am the speaker of the Palestinians." He said he loves Adolf Hitler, okay, and of course he was speaking for all Palestinians when he said this, famously, and wasn't just like simply a a British colonial, um, like a like a British colonial position appointment position. Um, he said, "I speak for all Palestinians." When I say Palestine as a state does not exist, we are all Arabs. We would love to live in other Arab nations in the region. Like, for example, if there was, I don't know, another nation that was created sometime in the future, we would love to live there. You know what I mean? We'd love to go up north or we'd love to go to Egypt, as a matter of fact, or we'd love to go to uh, Jordan. Conveniently, this is what I believe. I love believing as the Grand Mufti with all the power. I'm saying this with every single, well, every single Palestinian who also agrees with me that we are just a united monolithic Arab. And the real reasons why we hate the 1947 partition is because we hate Jews. That's what he was saying. <laughs> yeah. He also, yeah, he also goes wrote uh, Mein Kampf. Isn't that strange how the Grand Mufti had so much foresight to, to basically prove all of the uh, arguments that he is about to launch? All of the arguments that he's about to launch about how, one, Arabs are monolithic, and two, there is no Palestine or Palestinian identity, and three that uh, they are actually motivated not by a, a, an interest in developing a nation state for themselves, but instead out of Jew hate. So strange. Okay, let's hear what uh, Norm Finkelstein has to say about this argument, which is beautiful. He, he hit all of the notes. When divided, again, giving the vast majority of the arable land, the land that's usable, to the Arabs, the, again, the Israelis accepted it, the Arabs rejected it. Again, there was a Jewish majority in the area that was set aside for Israel. But the Arabs attacked in a genocidal war and tried to destroy Israel. The key point may have been motivated by fear is that the Arab and Muslim uh, people 
desperately didn't want there to be a Jewish entity. For the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, it was religious, that under uh, Islamic law, you can't give any land that was Muslim land over to a Jewish land. And then since that time, 19... What is he saying, bro? Wait, what? It, what? <laughs> bro. I have no idea what the fuck he's, he's talking about. He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. The Grand Mufti, who is a very important figure in this process, very important. Please don't look into it, okay? Please don't look into whether he was important or not, okay? He is the most important guy in Palestine, which doesn't exist. He admitted that it doesn't exist. I've also never heard that, like, Muslim land can never be given to non-Muslims or whatever the fuck. I've never heard that before, but maybe there's some, like, weird r slash atheism Andy out there who will explain to me that actually, as a matter of fact, some surah was misinterpreted as such or whatever the fuck, and that means that it really is a thing. But I'm pretty sure he just made that up. Which is weird, because he's like... Adding a religious justification to the Mufti, who, like, uh, I, I feel like he's adding a religious motivation to why the Mufti did not want um, uh, Jewish people to have a land or whatever, when he could have just kept it at, like, yeah, he doesn't like Jews, he's anti-Semitic. Why did you have to add, like, uh, some Islamic scripture interpretation into it as well? I thought the original argument was that, like, Palestinians don't want an Israeli state because they hate Jews. 67, uh, 2000, 2001, 2005, 2007. Israel has been willing to accept a two-state solution, and every Arab leader has rejected it. And uh, Israel abandoned the, the Gaza Strip uh, in 2005, took out not only every living person, but every dead person who was buried, left behind hothouses and agricultural equipment. Yes, they had to protect their borders, and they only had the blockade, the major blockade, after Hamas took okay. over and we're getting a little bit. I'm stop you there, just we're getting a little bit ahead of where I want to get to at the start of this debate. Yeah, by the way, it is weird. Even before Zionism, you're absolutely correct. Jews owned property in historical Palestine and all over the Ottoman Empire, which I guess the the <laughs> they they just didn't know. Christians did too. So strange that like uh, the Ottoman Empire personally. Uh, you know, having uh, control over the caliphate fucked that part up, I guess, and weren't being a real one to the Muslimic law and the Muslimic code of conduct, according to Alan Dershowitz, who knows better than everybody else, of course. Sure. Um, you've outlined your response to, to what Norman said there. Norman, in 1948, we had the Nabka, the catastrophe, as Palestinians call it. It's because the UN <clears throat> couldn't get people to agree to the proposal. Israel declared itself a state. War broke out. Uh, Israel gained more land. Special taxes on Jews were a thing, not just on Jews. Special taxes on non-Christians were a thing. It was, uh, they also, <clears throat> yes, it's called jizya. In the Ottoman Empire, there were special taxes specifically on non-Muslims, okay? Christians and Jews were made to pay jizya. It was in place of serving in the military, with the exception of, of course, the Shirme forces, which were, uh, you know, Janissary, like the highest, uh, not only the highest paid, but highest trained units in the Ottoman military. Uh, Muslims could not be Dev Shirme. Now, that tax was abolished, but regardless, if you ask the uh, Jewish people at the time, they much preferred living under Ottoman territory rather than a place like Spain, for example, as many Jews had fled Spain and come to the Ottoman territory at the time because they were not being murdered. So, you know, on the one hand, you have inquisition and pogroms. On the other hand, you pay a tax, but you have property ownership and have basically all the fucking... Uh, all the same amenities and all the same rights. <clears throat> you need to relativize history. I mean, in some respects, I guess you do. Um, yeah, Jizya is also less than Zakat, uh, percentage-wise, I think. But it doesn't really matter. Anyway.
The Jews fled Spain in, 19, uh, in 1492 after the crowd banned them. Before that, they were growing in equality slowly but surely. Yeah. During the Reconquista, the Spanish let Muslims convert and simply killed Jews. Bro, you can't fucking say that, like, the Jews would have... You can't do revisionism on, uh, on Spain, right? Like, saying that, no, 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 you don't understand. The Jews were surely about to get equality. When historically, this also predates... This literally predates uh, the Holocaust. We know what happened to Jews in Europe. Like, that's a wild... And that was much closer to today than, you know, the Spanish kingdom. So, like, obviously, I don't think anyone would make the argument that, like, Jews were pretty safe in Europe. They were not. Yeah, not the... Not, I'm going to issue a spoiler alert here and offer you a little bit more clarity on, on what happened throughout history. But that's wild to even consider. There has never been historically a greater enemy to Jewish people than various different Christian sects. One hundo p, like not even a not even a question. Anyone who disagrees with that, in my opinion, is revisionist. Straight up. Christians in general just don't really... I know that a lot of people say like, oh, Muslims hate non-believers. Like they want to kill the infidels or whatever. It's in the Quran. But like historically, historically speaking, and even in contemporary society, like especially when you factor in the, the Crusades and whatnot, Christians just really fucking don't like non-Christians. We don't really care about that sort of thing anymore. We've moved beyond it. It's more of a, you know, a, that killing is now conducted in the interest of capitalism. One could maybe make the argument that it was in the interest of plunder regardless. But like the galvanizing factor was definitely Christianity. Christians don't even like other Christians. It's true. There is that too. But I guess you could say the same about Muslims, I guess, when you talk about, like, uh, Saudi Arabia versus Iran, like Shia Sunnis or whatever. But, like, even then, that's marginal in comparison, in my opinion, to um, Christian infighting. And I think this is uncontestable than the UN originally assigned, mm -hmm. and many Palestinians were forced out of their homes. It's also true that at the same time, many Israelis were forced out of, or many Jewish people were forced out of their homes in Arab uh, countries. So there was a lot of displacement going on on both sides. And I would ask you, if you look at that in totality, some people have said to me, you know, if you actually go back to this period in time, both sides have a legitimate cause for complaint. Would you agree with that? I can't agree with that because we have to stick hard and fast to the factual record. The factual record is fairly clear on what happened in 1947 to 49 in the case of Israel and Palestine. Roughly 750,000 Palestinians uh, from what became the state of Israel were either expelled or fled in fear and ended up... I went to a Jewish museum in Granada, Spain. They said the Jews were always treated well, especially in comparison to the Christians after the Inquisition. Wait, what? I mean, I guess after what happened before and during. Can confirm I was told the same in Spain, <laughs> but even then I don't agree with it. Um, <clears throat> in El Andalus, we were treated well, but that was Muslims too, so... Yeah, I'm from Spain, and I don't remember there being any Jews in Spain. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. 
much to consider. <laughs> I went to Germany and saw that there weren't that many Jews in Germany, which is really confusing when you think about how many Jews used to live in the region, in the surrounding region. I'm sure something must have happened that caused many to flee. The refugees. Now, it's important to keep in mind, Piers, yeah, because Poland you and I well. think generously agreed to talk about the background. Frankly, I think you're the first person mm. I've noticed willing to talk about the background. That 200 and about 270,000 of those Palestinians who were expelled during the first uh, Arab-Israeli war, they ended up in Gaza. So if we want to take the point as a point of departure, 1947 to 49, the point of departure for Gaza is exactly the same. That's how Gaza became Gaza. 70 percent of the population of Gaza were became Palestinian refugees. Now, as to the question of what's sometimes called a population exchange between the Arabs who resided in, excuse me, the Jews who reside in the Arab world versus the Arabs who resided in what became the state of Israel, there really isn't, I don't want to get involved now in a scholarly debate uh, because it's simply not the time and place, but there isn't any good scholarship on what happened with those Arabs, Arab Jews in 1948. Some like the Yemeni Jews, everybody agrees they came willingly. The, the question of the Iraqi Jews, it's kind of a blur what happened. I'm not going to take one position or another on it. But I don't think those other aspects of the conflict ought to uh, distract us from the fundamental question that you asked. And I think it's a very good question to look at the back. Bro, literally, I'm sorry. It's really funny that you just said something where you sent me the Wikipedia page of the museum and you were like, this is the museum. And like the Wikipedia page very openly has this right here what do you think this is the sephardic museum in granada the officially officially the jewish quarter museum is a small museum in the city of granada spain dedicated to the recreation of the culture history people and traditions of the sephardic jews of jewish granada the museum a private initiative occur, uh, occupies a typical house in realejo the jewish quarter of granada before the expulsion of the jews in 1492 Like, you know, like it's, that's it. That's like, that's the point. I mean, I'm not making fun of that chatter, by the way. I'm just saying that like, even the, the, the obvious, uh, you know, the, the, regardless of what the, uh, the museum says, like it's built after some stuff happened, you know? Anyway, let's get back to the fucking actual main point here, which is Piers Morgan trying to both sides the expulsion stuff. Background. And the background to what happened, what happened on October 7th, it began with the expulsion of about 300,000 Palestinians into Gaza, and now they, comp they comprise about 70 to 80 percent of the population of Gaza and their descendants. Okay, well, Adam Dershowitz, you're disagreeing with, with what you're hearing there. Why? Fundamentally, the Nakba was a self-imposed wound. Ben Gurion, when he announced the establishment of Israel, welcomed all the Arabs. Isn't it crazy how Arabs just keep hitting themselves, dude? Palestinians specifically. I have to say that Norm here is wrong on this specifically. Yemeni Jews weren't expelled, but they didn't leave in a vacuum. In December 1947, there was a pogrom in Aden that the Jewish community from which half my family comes from was devastated. That was background of the immigration. Yes, I, I am not a denier of, of some of the, uh, or, or many of the uh, Jewish communities that came from other uh, surrounding Arab countries uh, left on their own, even though Avi Shalem specifically talks about Iraq and the Iraqi Jewish community. Um, there is obviously, there were a lot of expulsions that happened during periods of nationalism, post-colonial states uh, becoming Nakba denial, yikes. No, that's not Nakba denial. What the fuck are you talking about? You're misunderstanding the point. No, Jews were forcibly expelled, uh, expelled from surrounding Arab countries. This, none of this, of course, justifies Israel's ongoing apartheid regime or ethnic cleansing campaign, but that is a historical fact.
Obviously, it's not the same, and there are differences between different countries. But most of it, if you want to have a a, a reductive, broad, uh, if you want to have a a broad generalization over the Arab countries and the expulsions that occurred, uh, and the voluntary uh, uh, voluntary immigration into Israel from some of these countries, on top of the expulsions. The major role that played, the major factor here was Arab nationalist movements, as as uh, many of these countries were becoming countries as we know it now, becoming states as we know it and as we understand it now. Like, as far as I understand, as to my knowledge, and I might be wrong on this, a lot of the Jewish community in Turkey. And there was a big uh, Jewish community in not just the Ottoman Empire, but like in Turkey proper, right? What we know as Turkey. Um, they voluntarily left to go to Israel. Many people. They did not leave because they were being uh, forcibly removed or anything like that, but they voluntarily left to go to Israel. There are examples like this as well. There's still a very small Jewish community in Istanbul and in Turkey in general that remained. But plenty went, uh, plenty left uh, for Israel voluntarily. In Iraq specifically, there's also collusion there with the Zionist agency, but I haven't heard that about other places. It absolutely is not the same as Nakba, but it's still, it's still immoral. And yeah, my paternal grandpa came from Turkey voluntarily. Yep. Did you know any Jews growing up? Um, No. I don't think so. I don't think I ever met a Jewish person until I came to America. Go kill yourself. Hassan is a spoiled brat. You suck. Go kill yourself. <laughs> Bro, your username is Twith Thoughts. Arabs to stay. He didn't want to expel a single one, but the Arab countries engaged in a genocidal war designed to kill every Jew and destroy Israel. It was as a result of that invasion that Palestinians left or were expelled. Now, I happen to have studied the situation with Iraqi Jews because I was one of those people who helped draft Resolution 242 at the United Nations, and we looked at great detail into the history of Jews in places like Iraq. In Iraq, there was a Nazi pogrom during the Second World War, and there were additional pogroms in other Arab countries in which Jews had no choice but to leave. And there was an exchange of population, much as there were in Sudetenland, much as there were in Pakistan and India, and every other country in the world. The refugees were incorporated, assimilated into the society. But UNRWA, this horrible, horrible organization, was set up to keep the Arabs refugees, to keep them in camps, to make sure there was a festering wound. The Jews were integrated into society. No, they weren't first-class citizens in the beginning, but now they dominate the country. The same thing could have happened to the Arabs who left Israel. They could have been integrated into the surrounding countries in Instead, they were kept in camps and told that they had to destroy Israel, they had to have a right of return, they had to go back, that history can't stop and you can't move forward, you have to only move backwards. So the sole fault for the refugees was the attack by the Arab countries designed to kill Israelis. That's when the expulsions and the leavings occurred. So <laughs> designed to kill Israelis. Before Israel even existed, but mind you. Before, before, we go, before, I go back to, leadership. before I go yeah. back to Norman uh, for response to that, yeah. from your understanding, how many Jewish people were displaced from their homes in this early period? Because I've heard it was we actually a lot. It was between seven and 800,000 with probably a trillion dollars worth of wealth. These were people who had lived in these countries longer than the Muslims. They had lived there since the Babylonian exile. Uh <laughs> Wait, what? Uh, 2,000 years earlier. They had been full citizens. They were dhimis. They were second class because they were not, not Muslims. But they lived in peace. And once this happened, uh, many were expelled. Some left voluntarily. I can see that to uh, Mr. Finkelstein. But many left. About the same number were left voluntarily. Remember, too, with the Arabs, they were told to leave and they would come back victorious after in Haifa, for example, many of them wanted to stay and many did stay, but the Arab leadership said, leave, we'll come back victorious, you'll have everything back. This is a complex situation. It's 75 years ago. There is a statute of limitations on things like this. A much of it was a reaction to Arab nationalism in conjunction with Zionism. I mean, Arab Jews who were locals for centuries were seen with suspicion ever since Balfour, and especially the 1929 riots, even more so after the Biltmore Declaration, a which side are you on kind of thing. Whether or not they'd be included in the Arab nationalist project, IG, the answer became no in regards to Aden. I think one of the funniest arguments that a lot of Zionists also uh, point to 
with respect to like Palestinian Muslims and Christians being somehow different from the Jews that lived there 3000 years ago is that many of the Palestinian Muslims and Christians that they're fucking killing are direct descendants of the OG Jews that just stayed there and converted. So that's also another very weird part of this. Like this is actually 4,000 years of history that you're denying uh, argument. Like you're literally killing your grandparents, like the descendants of your grandparents. So there is that too. There is that aspect to this uh, conversation as well. A moral statute of limitations. Move on. Establish yourselves in the countries that you left and went to. Get rid of these refugee camps. Get rid of UNRWA and become full citizens of the countries you moved to. UNRWA. My grandparents became full citizens of the United okay, States. Let me, let me after the pogroms had made them leave Poland. Okay, I come to Norman Finkelstein. Your response to that. Okay, thank you, Piers. First of all, as a general point, I agree with the notion of a statute of limitations on your claims to a parcel of land. The first time I came across that expression was reading Arnold Toynbee's great history of the history of the world, actually. And he makes the point in his history that isn't there a statute of limitation on the claims of Jews to Palestine? He said that claim was made 2000 years ago. And it's claimed that even today it's claimed that based on what happened 2000 years ago, there's a large portion of Israeli population who believes they have title to the West Bank. They have title to Gaza because of that claim 2,000 years ago. Isn't there a I statute of that. limitations? Allow me to complete my thought and then you can disagree. Isn't there a statute of limitations on the claim from two to 3,000 years ago? Now, yeah. I want to focus on Gaza. I, want, I would like to focus on Gaza. The population is expelled from Israel into Gaza. Now, if you look at Benny Morris's history called Border Wars, he says that between 1949 and 1953, literally, listen closely, about 2,700 to 5,000 Palestinian expellees, that's including in the West Bank and in Gaza, between 2,700 and 5,000 Palestinian expellees were killed by Israel when they tried to return home. Now, Benny Mara says 90% of those killed were unarmed. They were what he called economic infiltrates who wanted to see their homes. They wanted to see yeah. their land. They wanted to see their neighbors. They were brutally, if you believe Professor Morris, brutally murdered between those years. It it's not just Professor Benny Morris. Professor Benny Morris is one of the people cursed, or I guess blessed, with uncovering the truth early on as a part of the New Historians. But since then, many more investigations were conducted, uh, which is ironic because the investigations I'm talking about weren't like, I don't know, uncovering some secret tomes or anything. It was literally just asking the, the, the early Zionist brigades and the veterans of said early Zionist brigades what they had done and then having them openly describe how they shot Palestinians that were trying to return to their homes under the directive from the Israeli government or even before then uh, the, the brigades themselves that were supposed to after the forcible expulsion was completed, not allow Palestinians to return to their homes. So Norm is talking about this part, um, and he mentions Benny Morris. True. But there's even more evidence than uh, simply Benny Morris's writings on this. 1956, as you know, peers, England, France, and Israel invaded Egypt, including at the time, Gaza. What happened then? According to Benny Morris <clears throat> in the book Border Wars, he said between 470 and 500 Palestinian men were lined up and shot down. Now let's bear in mind, Piers, this is long, long before this entity called Hamas came into the picture. Now if we fast forward to 1967, after Israel occupies Gaza, there are new assaults on the people of Gaza, this time carried on by, at the time, defense, no, he wasn't defense, agricultural minister, Ariel Sharon. Now, without getting sidetracked, I do have to say, Professor Dershowitz, every time I listen to you, even when we debated each other in 2003, I guess, or 2004, I can't recall, you keep escalating your claims about having written UN Resolution 242 or contributed to the resolution. Professor Dershowitz, mm -hmm. I understand people have fantasies and I understand that people have failings of memory as they get older. But Professor Dershowitz, when we had a by the way, for those of you who don't know the background, 
I guess the short and sweet of it is that Norm Finkelstein um, found the academics claim uh, the academic claims made by a uh, Israeli scholar at the time or someone writing about Israel at the time to be fraudulent. Um, he cooked it. He he absolutely destroyed this other scholar at the time. Norm Finkelstein, or not Norm Finkelstein, sorry. The Dersh then took the fraudulent scholar's work and plagiarized it in his other book. So then Norm turned around and very famously destroyed Alan Dershowitz for not only using, uh, Joan Peters was the, was, uh, the, the original uh, author, yes. So then Norm Finkelstein basically cooked Alan Dershowitz for one, using faulty data, from Joan Peters from Time Memorial. Thank you guys for helping me with this. And then and then doubly cooked him for plagiarizing the faulty data uh that uh he was uh, that that uh, Alan Dershowitz was using. Now for this crime, Alan Dershowitz who had a shit ton of social capital in uh at Harvard and and everywhere else really, very famous very famous professor and also very famous defense attorney turned around and got Norm blacklisted from every single uh, institute of higher learning, pretty much. Yeah, plagiarizing a fraud. I think Norman called it back then. They debated on uh, they debated on democracy now. Norm is obviously, uh, you know, he's he's an interesting guy. He's very spicy. You might not agree with his style. But there's one thing that he's very good at, which is he's a stubborn guy. He's a very honest guy, honest to a fault and stubborn to a fault. And he is a phenomenal chronicler of the truth, especially as it pertains to Gaza. But there's another part that he's that there is another part that he's a phenomenal chronicler of the truth on. And that is the many misdeeds of Alan motherfucking Dershowitz. So. In many respects, he's great at having this conversation with Alan Dershowitz because, goddamn, he's had this conversation a million times over and has cooked him a lot throughout that entire time. In our original debate, you didn't even know who wrote UN Resolution 242. You had all these names. It was Lord <laughs> Carradine. Anybody who was involved in the process would know that. So let's, make, let's agree on one thing. We both, both of us, should agree <clears throat> to only state facts. And if we have any doubts about the facts, let's set them aside and try to give viewers, listeners, as accurate a record as possible. We can disagree. But when you engage in your fantasies, it really, to me, is very disturbing and disorienting. OK, well, let me ask Professor Dershowitz to, to, to respond. Well, first of all, let's get the facts straight. I was Arthur Goldberg's law clerk. Arthur Goldberg was the United States representative to the United Nations. He asked me to come down. I actually moved in with him at the Waldorf Astoria Towers and work with him on, on 242. Yes, I confused the name Carrington with something else, but I worked closely. In fact, I was partly Lord responsible for Carradine. changing the words. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I worked on the matter. I didn't work with Lord Carradine. I worked with Arthur Goldberg. And together we managed to get rid of the word Palestinian before refugees in order to make sure that the resolution applied both to Palestinian refugees Pierce, and to this is Jewish pure science refugees. Fiction, which now, I you're easily now, you're inter now you're interrupting me. So let me finish. This is a detail. It's a fact. Now let's talk about what happened involving the Gaza Strip. I agree there's a statute of limitations. I'm opposed to any biblical claims on Israel. I believe Israel has a, a political and moral claim to the land. There have always been Jews living there from the time of Jesus and Mohammed to 1948. And wisely, the British decided for a compromise plan for, for division. And that plan was accepted by the Jewish and Zionist leaders. It was rejected by the Palestinians. And then, as you know, Israel tried to give the entire Gaza Strip over to Egypt, back to Egypt, during the Camp David Accords. It almost caused a breakdown in the Camp David meetings because the Egyptians didn't want it. And Israel very reluctantly held on to it. And then in 2005, Israel abandoned the Gaza. And only when rockets and a bloody coup occurred did Israel respond by having border controls. Let me tell you one thing. They weren't strong enough. If there had been better border controls, Hamas would not have been allowed to bring in concrete, which it used to build tunnels, to bring in weapons, which it used to murder all these people on October 7th. So Israel was not strong enough. It should have had far better border controls as other countries had in comparable situations. And so one more point. It's hard to it's hard to enact really good border controls when your borders are just like expanding, though. You know, willy nilly. That's what it is. <laughs> just like 
because they have some ambitious borders, you know? And sometimes they extend quite a bit. Toynbee and, and, and Benny Morris both are regarded as kind of one-sided uh, uh, historians. There are claims uh, uh, that dispute both of them, particularly Toynbee. Toynbee was an overtly anti-Zionist historian who didn't believe that the Jewish people had any claim uh, to Israel. There's also a statute of limitations on that. And so let's move forward. And moving forward means... Wait, what, do you, what does he mean there's a statute of limitations on, like... This is such a dumb fucking conversation. I think Norm did a pretty good job of, like... Ta casting aside the historical claim, like the statute of limitations on on what kind of like historic claim you can lay to a, a piece of land by saying if you if I am to believe and this is the this is the never ending argument with Zionists and anti Zionists, which is that if you have a statute of limitations uh, that that extends to the claim that like Jews historically deserved that entire land, including Judea and Samaria, which is known as West Bank. OK, that that like. If that's the historic claim, then what about the fucking Palestinian people that currently are existing there that have a very real, very valid fucking historic claim to all histor all of historic Palestine? Like, that's ridiculous. How am I supposed to fucking not see that very real, very valid, very ongoing uh, uh, evisceration of the Palestinian population and, and think much broader in much broader terms as though like your claim is stronger it's so dumb means potentially uh, a solution where hamas is no longer in control of gaza uh, remember too you're absolutely right norman uh Terrorism began way before Hamas. Terrorism was an essential part of the Palestinian leadership. The U.S. Damn, I thought he was going to say about the for the Israeli government, like in its formation. I thought he was going to be like, "Yeah, we did terrorism, King David Hotel, baby." Olympic. Uh, nope, I was wrong. Uh, massacres that occurred way before Hamas. Uh, the, the the terrorism on airplanes, the blowing up of airplanes, the hijacking of airplanes. The problem is that the world rewarded terrorism and it's rewarding them again um, by allowing Hamas. It is. The world is rewarding terrorism. That part is true. That part is true. It's just Israeli terrorism is what the world is rewarding, which is why Israel keeps getting crazier and crazier in its actions and expanding greatly on the targets that it declares, uh, you know, defensible murders. The infrastructure that gave Pal refugees weren't just shot. Every time a violent crime was committed, the IDF would go, would do reprisal operations throughout the 50s where they go to suspect villages and shoot up a dozen civilians. They just mentioned Ariel Sharon. Wouldn't you know? Oh, the Kibia massacre. To free uh, hundreds of okay. people, legitimately many convicted, not all convicted, many convicted, in exchange for a small number of completely innocent hostages. You can't compare completely innocent hostages with convicted murderers. Okay, look, Norman, respond to that. But also, uh, I also want to move on, yes, once, you once you've responded to it, also move on, if you will, to the issue of settlements. Because one of the things I find hardest to have any sympathy with Israel about is the continued expansion of settlements. I agree. Uh, and in particular, the West Bank. And I think we may find some... Is he... Under the camera, is he unwrapping a chocolate or something? What's going on there? I feel like there's a very specific wrapper. It sounds like a very specific type of wrapper. Consensus here. But first of all, Norman, your response yeah. to uh, what Alan Dershowitz just I can't believe your base put you through that for nothing, Lamau, useless. What? My base? Said, but also then move it to settlements. Yeah, well, I would like to try to... You know, actually, I can bring it up to the settlements uh, on the case of Gaza. Yeah, it so sounds like I a like Werther's original. I would like to just where I left off with, so to speak, at the risk of being boring, the timeline. And uh, I said in 1970, there were uh, atrocities committed in Gaza against the people of Gaza by the uh, agriculture... head by the agricultural minister at the time, Ariel Sharon. In 1987, as you perhaps remember, Piers, the first intifada broke out. It was an overwhelmingly... Here I quote Danny Morris from his book, Righteous Victims. It was an overwhelmingly nonviolent civil resistance to the Israeli occupation. By 1990, three years after the beginning, or really two years, because it began in December 7, 1987, by 1990, Israel started to institute, again, I'm sticking strictly to Gaza, what it called a closure policy. And the closure policy was basically to seal off Gaza, okay? By 2002, 2003, if you read uh, Baruch Kimmerling, he was a senior Sony sociologist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, he described Gaza as, quote, the largest concentration camp ever. Now, you might say Baruch Kimmerling was a person of the left, and I will grant that. But then we have Giora Island. Giora Island at the time was the head of Israel's National Security Council. He said in March 2003, and now I'm quoting him, he described Gaza as a huge concentration camp. So you can say there is a consensus among knowledgeable people 
sociologist at the Hebrew University, head of the National Security Council, that Israel had turned Gaza into a concentration mm -hmm. camp. In 2006, Wrong. in 2006, there was an election in January 2006. Hamas wins the election basically on the platform of reform because the Palestinian Authority is proverbially corrupt. It comes into power. Immediately as it comes into power, Israel institutes this brutal economic blockade on Gaza. And at that point, uh, uh, there have been various descriptions. I'm sure, Piers, you wouldn't disagree. You wouldn't call The Economist a left-wing magazine or anti-Semitic. It described Gaza as, quote, a toxic dump. And uh, at that point, it had a high, it, slowly, just to give you one example, Piers, and your listeners, because they should have a sense of what this blockade looked like. Israel's explicit policy, its explicit policy was to keep Gaza on the precipice of economic catastrophe. That's how they described their policy. They prohibited baby chicks from entering Gaza. They pr prohibited chocolate from entering Gaza. They prohibited potato chips from entering Gaza. They pr pr prohibited any spices from entering Gaza. And it prohibited any exports from Gaza, except at some point, occasionally, things like strawberries. So what had happened to Gaza? It had, on the eve of 2007, it had the highest unemployment rate in the world. It was about 60% unemployed, 50% uh, for the population as a whole, 60% for youth. The people in Gaza were left to languish and die, no past, no present, no future, to languish and die in a concentration camp. That was their prospect as of October 6, 2003. Excuse me, yeah, 2023. May I Sorry about that. May I respond? Well, I'll tell you what, yes, actually, I, actually, on that point, Professor Dershowitz, you respond to that point briefly, if, if you could. And then I want to come back to Norman Finkelstein to move it on to settlement. So, Alan, just respond to what... Uh, oh, I mean, just respond to that suggestion, sure. which has been cited by many people, that the conditions in Gaza, in the period that Norman Finkelstein has been referring to, have been described by many people as bordering on a concentration camp. And at the very least, a form of occupation where Israel wielded far too much control over what could come in and out of Gaza, including people. Our base defender of Palestinian emancipation, Piers Morgan... My goat, my king. The issue is so one-sided that like anyone that consistently wants to hold these debates ends up coming across like they are defenders, like ardent defenders of Palestinians, even if they originally did not have that intention. The speculation that I have here is that Pierce Morgan is a mercenary. He's a mercenary who only cares about one thing, which is improving his social standing, improving his clout, making more money. I think Piers Morgan found out after October 7 that there's a lot of interest and a lot of momentum on the, the Palestinian conversation. He saw the ratings, he read the room, and he basically kept you know, hitting that vein over and over again. Ever since you wanted a show, uh, I noticed that you weren't as brutal about making fun of him. No, I mean, I, I mean, guys, I called him a, a, a gorilla in a suit, which is definitely the, the same perspective that I have for any and every one of these Western clowns. They wear suits to present themselves as anything but barbaric, even though their actions are barbaric. That's the truth. And I'm currently very politely describing. Oh, I didn't say gorilla. I said baboon in a suit. And I'm very politely describing what he's doing here. It's not because, like, he himself personally had a slight change of heart. I think... I think personally, he saw the writing on the wall and changed course only a little bit in an effort to maximize on the view counts. That's it. So that people were very interested in listening to a conversation amongst two people about Israel, Palestine. And that's why he keeps hitting that vein over and over again. 
Well, they write in the description that it was a toxic place. Uh, it was a toxic place because Hamas took over and because Hamas robbed the people of Gaza of their food. It took the material that was sent from Europe, from countries around the world, and took it away from the children and took it away from the hospitals, took it away from the schools, and, and gave it to their fighters to build 350 miles of tunnels. Uh, imagine what could have been done with all the resources that had been sent to Gaza. There was plenty of food in Gaza, except that Hamas was using it. There was plenty of material to build hospitals in Gaza, but instead Hamas was using it. It's Hamas that turned it into a, a toxic, toxic place. When Israel, in fact, uh, occupied it, actually occupied it, it was in much better shape than when Hamas took it over. And so it's Hamas's fault. Hamas turned Gaza into this horrible place. And let's remember, Israel has been prepared to give up Gaza over and over again. It tried desperately to give it back to Egypt in, in, during the Camp David. It tried desperately. Yeah, dude, it's Hamas that has been bombing the hospitals and, and the schools for the past six months every single day to allow for a two, the, the 2007 Omer plan, Gaza is given to a Palestinian state. The 2000, 2000, 2001 Bill Clinton plan, Gaza is given over. They rejected it. If it was a toxic concentration camp, the guards were not Israelis. The guards were Hamas people who were throwing gay people off the roof, okay. who were murdering Palestinian <laughs> Authority people. They were throwing gay people off the roofs. Okay. People, and who were denying women the right to live their lives decently. People still, dude, this is awesome. Like, Alan Dershowitz gives a fuck about gay people. Come on, dude. Come on, big dog. Recently, okay. yes, women. Gaza was a terrible place, completely the fault of Hamas. Can we reach a point of agreement on the issue of settlements? I, I suspect we can. Briefly, so, so Norman Finkelstein, I don't want to keep responding. Me, I don't want you to keep responding to each other about, about that. What, one I, sentence, what I would like you to one do. Sentence, what is it, what I, oh, yeah, okay, give me one sentence, but then please address the issue one of settlements. Sentence. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, a thousand humanitarian and economic organizations have all reached the same conclusion. It's very simple. The main cause of the disaster in Gaza is Israel's illegal blockade of that parcel of land. Full stop. That's wrong. That's wrong. Um, did that ever happen? Throwing gay people off the roofs? No, that's a ISIS thing. But it works really well. I think ISIS did that one time. And it, it, it works really well for... It works really well for people that it's just Islamophobia because you're like, oh, ISIS did that. So that's like definitely what all Muslims do. That's definitely what Hamas is doing. By the way, <laughs> like what's the argument here? Hamas is fucking throwing gay people off the roof. So Israel is actually doing a humanitarian bombing campaign by fucking what? Blowing the gays themselves? Like... Blowing up the gays themselves? Like, what the fuck do you mean? Like, it's so fucking stupid. There is no argument there. It just doesn't make any sense. That's wrong. That's false. Who's wrong? Who's wrong? Um, that is That's wrong. wrong. The World the, Bank the, is the wrong. Blockade, the International the Monetary the Fund is wrong. They're yes, all wrong. Yes, Are yes, they all anti-Semitic? Yes, is that what's going on? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. They're wrong. I no, they're just wrong. I mean, so why are they all wrong? Any of them. That, because the blockade was completely lawful. It was designed to prevent the importation and then the use of rockets okay. against Israel. It's perfectly lawful so for a country to engage every, in a blockade. Every, that is, okay. you're not, let me finish. Okay. You can't have a double, Look, Israel is exposed to a double standard, but Professor we're not letting Dershowitz. you impose a double standard on me. No, I'm going to finish my statement and you're uh, not going to interrupt me. Uh, so understand me. The, 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 the military occupation was lawful. The blockade was lawful. Every country has the right to defend itself from rockets, from terror tunnels, huh. from people coming over the border, murdering huh. and kidnapping people. Those are all lawful. I'm telling you that as an expert in international law and the law of war. Okay. If you want to dispute me, get an expert who knows something about international law. Okay. Not a, not, not a polemicist Professor, like Professor you. Professor Dershowitz. That's so awesome. The only thing Professor Dershowitz is an expert in is lowering the age of consent laws, okay? He's only an expert in knowing what the age of consent laws are in each individual state. And also, furthermore, an expert in constitutionally uh, advocating to lower the age of consent laws by making the most idiotic argument, uh, argument towards abortion. If 16-year-olds can get abortions without their parents' consent, they can consent to an abortion. They can consent to being fucked, is what Alan Dershowitz's constitutional argument was, famously. Just reminding everybody that... You know, uh, just never forget that. He has defended that as recently as like a couple of years ago, for the record. Oh, he said 15 actually. Fuck. Well, I'm not an expert in remembering Alan Dershowitz's uh, weird, perverted fantasies. He's also an expert at pulling his pants down for a massage.
He's an expert in uh, being friends with Jeffrey Epstein and receiving massages with the pants on at all times, he said. Um, yeah. Okay, Professor Dershowitz, just as a matter of fact, I teach the laws of war. I've been teaching it yeah, for the last five years. It. To, to yeah, my, to my understanding, you're, you're, you're biased. Prof okay, Professor Dershowitz, okay, Professor Dershowitz, let's agree. I'm completely ignorant. Let's take that as a point of departure. How does it come to be yes. that every humanitarian and political body in the world <laughs> has yeah. declared that the blockade of Gaza constitutes collective punishment? Because they're all ignorant. They're all ignorant. Only I know the truth. <laughs> Only I know what international law looks like. Not the guys who write the international law, by the way. Not the, not the international organizations. <laughs> that are supposed to be tasked with defending international law. Only I know. Punishment, and therefore is a violation, a breach of international law, a war crime under international law. How did that come to pass? They're wrong. How is it you, first that First of all, every, you're wrong. They're all you're, wrong. No, you're not, you're all not wrong. right. Except you're not right. No, no, no. Except you're wrong, sir, you're wrong sir, in describing, you're, you're wrong in describing name, name every one, group. There are many groups. One, okay. Professor Dershowitz, name me one legal international yeah. legal body or human rights organization. Name me one. I'll take the pause. Name me one that, what? that says the blockade of Gaza is not uh, collective punishment. Name me one. The law, the lawfare project in the United States. Um, the, law the, uh, the lawfare uh, project. I said, name me the, one the, international the, legal or political body. It is. One. It is. No, Everybody's listening now. Body. Piers Morgan it's has a very large audience. Name me it's, one. It's name me one international, international or legal, legal or political body that says. <laughs> uh, I'll have you know, uh, Norm Finkelstein, sir. Uh, the Friends of Israel's Not Doing a Genocide Project is actually a very reputable think tank based out of Langley that is being supported by American citizens that also have, you know, uh, Israeli nationality, but American citizens nonetheless. And they have declared as the internationally renowned humanitarian organization that what Israel is doing is pretty pog. Okay, that's right. The Lawfare Project. Founder Brooke Goldstein is an American nonprofit think tank and litigation fund that works to protect the human and civil rights of Jewish and pro-Israel communities worldwide. The project funds legal actions to protect free speech and civil rights, challenging anti-Semitism and discrimination against Jews. <sighs> the world's only international pro-Israel litigation fund. <laughs> Bro, I mean, I was joking. When I said, like, the Friends of Apartheid Foundation, but it's not even fucking off base, dude. He's like, uh, the UN? Wrong. The United Nations? More like united in their defense of Islamist fundamentalism, actually. Uh -huh. That's awesome. In June 2017, the law firm project, the law firm Winston & Strawn, filed a lawsuit against Sanford Group of SFSU students and members of the local Jewish community alleging that the public school had fostered a climate of anti-Semitism marked by violent threats to the safety of Jewish students on campus. The suit alleged that the school has violated the plaintiff's constitutional rights. In addition to the federal lawsuit, the law firm project, the Winston & Strawn, filed a second lawsuit in February 2018. So what happened? What happened with the lawsuit? Why does this not have a conclusion? They fucking prepared a lawsuit against the Irish Occupied Territories Bill, which enacted were criminalized trade with Israeli settlers. It argued that the bill violates European Union trade regulations. Remember, Israeli settlers. Like, you have to keep doing trade with Israeli settlers living in occupied West Bank. Seems like a really, seems like the, the arbiter of truth and justice, uh, if I do say so myself, seems like this is the, the, the international, this is the international community, uh, finally sticking it to the man. The, the blockade of Gaza is legal. Name me one. It, it, it is legal, one. and every or, every organization that I have been associated with, the Lawfare Project, the project run I by a woman that. named Leitner, and I it's a national that. project, we're all, all, have all concluded I, that the blockade I is legal. Also, legal the Israeli Supreme... The, let, let, me, let me finish. The Israeli Supreme Court, which is above... Norm is biased, though. Yeah, whereas Alan Dershowitz is not biased, uh, seemingly.
Yeah, of course Norm is biased, bro. Yeah, he's biased. He's anti-genocide. The fuck do you mean he's biased? Like, you can say that about me to be like, Hassan is Muslim. He's biased. Oh, he must hate Jews secretly or something. But, like, Norm Finkelstein is Jewish. He's a descendant of Holocaust survivors. You know what I mean? I think that's why he frustrates people to no end. That and also because he's, like, incredibly stubborn and does say a lot of stuff that, like, I would never say. You know what I mean? I said to agree, bro. Yeah. And which is much fairer than the International Court of Justice has also, with limits, has said that blockades designed to prevent the bringing of rockets to Israel is lawful. Also, use your common sense. What possible reason would there be for allowing a, 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 a group in Gaza, a group of Hamas, to send rockets without trying to blockade them from bringing the rockets in and building tunnels? Use your common sense. Of course it's unlawful. Okay. Every really good, really good solution to this. Are you ready? End the blockade and end the apartheid. And then the bathtub rockets that they're fucking lobbing over the border that you put up will cease to exist. Wait, did he bring up the Israeli Supreme Court to say that it's, it's, <laughs> that's an international body that does not think? No, did I misunderstand? Did you say, did you? Trying to blockade me for bringing of rockets to Israel is lawful. Also, it's has said that blockade and which is so the Israeli Supreme, the, let, let me, let me finish. The Israeli Supreme Court, which is above reproach and which. Is the Israeli Supreme Court, bro, that's literally being like, I don't understand. Why are you telling me the, the Holocaust is being. Uh, the Holocaust is abhorrent. The Nazi Supreme Court decided it was legal and valid. Excuse me. Um, here is an internationally recognized legal body that everybody thinks is infallible. The Israeli Supreme Court. That's awesome. That's a claim that, why do they need a pro-Israel legal fund? That's a claim that needs to be proven. Can't just say it. You weren't even joking about the bathtub rockets. They really do DIY snipers and bombs. That's crazy. I thought Iran gave them everything, but they actually make their own shit using the materials they find alongside Iranian resources they get. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Is an endless testament to Palestinian resilience, honestly. It's just crazy. He doesn't need to feel silly. What? It's much mean? fairer than the International Court of Justice has also, with limits, has said that blockades designed to prevent the bringing of rockets to Israel is lawful. Also, use your common sense. What possible reason would there be for allowing a, 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 a group in Gaza, a group of Hamas, to send rockets without trying to blockade them from bringing the rockets in and building tunnels? Use your... I'm glad that the Israeli Supreme Court decided that the, uh, that the Israeli blockade was totally valid. Surely, surely they would have said something if they didn't think that it was valid. This is just common sense. Common sense. Of course it's unlawful. Okay. Every country in the world would do exactly the same as Israel okay, did. Listen, I, think we've, I think we've exhausted this part this of the debate. From being I do want to, before we run out of time, we only have about five minutes left. I do want to get into sure. settlements. And I'll start with you, Professor Engelsley. The, the issue of settlements, I think, is, is pretty much indefensible, actually, what's been going on, and particularly Ooh! in recent years. Wow. Is it pretty much indefensible? Oh, no. The liberal Zionist has spoken out. That's right. The settlements are pretty much indefensible. Deus Ex rocking ya. Yeah. Thank you for the five tour and give the subs. Uh, on the West Bank. But what is your overview of the settlement issue? My overview of the settlements, as in all topics, is what international law says. Under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it's illegal for an occupying power to transfer its population to occupy territory. Now, when that issue came before the International Court of Justice in July 2004, every single judge, every single judge, including the American judge, Mr. Bergenthal, 18.7 million watch women's NCAA finals, but nobody cares about women's sports pecker. The fuck? Are you okay, dude? They all agreed on that one point. The settlements are illegal under international law. Now, under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, those settlements constitute war crimes. 
So what we're talking about now, since the settlement activity began right after the June 1967 war, what we're talking about is a protracted war crime over a period of a half century. And that's sometimes missed. When we talk about what's happened to Gaza, we're talking about two decades. If you go back to the closure in 1990, we're talking about the martyrdom of a people over three decades. Those young men who burst the gates of Gaza on October 7th were born into, to use your phrase now, a toxic concentration camp. They were born into it. And that settlement activity, which under the Rome statute is a war crime, that's been ongoing for a half century. Okay, let me get, let me get Professor Dutch's response. Let me respond, respond. please. Yes, let me respond. Yeah. First of all, Finkelstein and Hamas regard Tel Aviv and Jerusalem as settlements. So you can't take them seriously about anything. They regard all of Israel as, as settlements. And yes, I disagree with uh, settlements on the West Bank. I have since 1970 when I debated Noam Chomsky. I called for a two-state solution. I agree with a military occupation designed to prevent rockets and prevent terrorism. But I disagree with civilian settlements. But the poor, core point I want to mention Are they is crimes? ultimately we've gotten to this point. Wait a second. No, of course not they are not war wait what why are they oh so you just have a simple disagreement like what did they look ugly to you or something like i don't get it he's like i agree with a military occupation to stop rockets rockets aren't being lobbed from the west bank by the way but you know they should be occupied anyway i also don't uh i don't i disagree with the settlements because like what there aren't enough or something I i'm confused <laughs> the guy disagree with the settlements because there should be way more settlements or crimes at all they are disputes over what constitutes the un resolution 242 the un says they're illegal the un says they're illegal what does that leave it the un says a lot of things the un if you oh he's there wrong the un is wrong excuse me excuse me i would like to go back to my previous point uh the israeli supreme court now that's an infallible institution the the uh, the ultimate facilitator of truth and justice okay fuck the un they're hamas hamas let me let me uh refer to you to my let me refer to you to my uh <laughs> to my completely unbiased impartial international legal institution uh settlements or poggers fund that's right. It's comprised entirely of Christian Zionist funders from Dallas, Texas. And uh, they have declared that the Israeli settlements in the West Bank are actually not illegal and very cool. I disagree with them, of course. But aesthetically, they, I, don't, I think they should be using brutalist architecture and not whatever the fuck they're using right now. The UN also called Israel Zionism racism. The UN has no authority to define international law. The UN can who give advisory opinions. Who does? Who does? Let, me, let, me, let, me, let me please, the let me finish. So remember who appoints the justices. Countries appoint the justices. So when Lebanon appoints a justice, it's Hezbollah's appointing the justice. The International Court of Justice <laughs> is an ill- Yeah! <laughs> Hezbollah justices. Hezbollah judges, dude. Hamas judges. Legitimate court. It is dude, every argument, every argument from an Israel defender inevitably devolves into just like unrestricted, unadulterated racism. It's fucking awesome. It's always just like, uh, can you really trust Arabs? I mean, they are fucking freakish terrorist monster barbarian rapists. Like, even when they are internationally renowned legal scholars and shit. You know what I mean? That's awesome. It's just pure bigotry. It's not a real court. But I want to get to the core point. But Thomas Burns is not a real court. It's run, it's run by Hamas and other Arabs. Oh, Thomas wait, 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 let me finish, please. American let judge. me finish. Said let me finish. Wait, what, Finkelstein, what, what Finkelstein is finally saying is that these people, he called them martyrs. I was at Beira. I was. Yeah, by the way, that's, that was J uh, Benny Morris's argument, too. Remember when he was like, uh, excuse me, they put a Syrian in charge. <laughs> you can't trust the Arab mind. The Arab mind is fickle. They're very clever dogs, those Arabs. Basically. So, like, that's the renowned, you know, that's the renowned scholar of Israeli history saying that, okay? The blockade stops rockets. Funny, June 2009, a Haaretz investigation showed that the security establishment calculated a humanitarian minimum for food entry. After much denial and three years of legal battle, Gisha uncovered a Kogat uh, presentation with calculated red lines for food items. A leaked cable from the U.S. Embassy in Israel said the policy was to keep Gazan economy on the brink of collapse without quite pushing it over the edge. Also... Uh, fuck, I forget who originally said this, but like, 
They also jokingly mentioned uh, calling it putting the Palestinians on a diet as well with their uh, restrictive choices of what kind of food is allowed in to uh, the Gaza Strip. At the Nova Music Festival, I saw the remnants of where a woman uh, named Vivian Silver, a peacenik, who used to go over and bring Hamas and, 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 and Gazan people to hospitals, was burnt to death. I saw where people were raped. There is no justification for collective rape. There is no justification for murdering a peacenik. Collective. This woman was probably murdered by the very people she brought to hospitals because they knew exactly where she lived and where the hospitals. It's an abomination to even suggest that any kind of martyrdom, dispute over land, dispute over any, could justify what happened on October 7th. Shame on anybody who thinks that oh, civilized human up, beings dude. should shut be up. praised shut or even justified up. for shut doing what up. they did. Did. I met a man whose son had been beheaded, and Hamas then took his head, brought it back to Gaza, put it on sale for $10,000, and this father had to bury his son without a head. That's what Hamas did. And not only Hamas, but people, ordinary civilians in Gaza, came over the border and participated in these rapes and murders. And shame on anybody who doesn't unequivocally condemn it. There is no justification for what happened on October 7th, no matter what the history is. The hi Dove Wiseglass, the senior advisor of the government, said that in 2006. History is disputed, <laughs> but I want to hear Norman Finkelstein say unequivocally, no matter what the history is, there is no justification for the massacres of October okay, 7th. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll end with Norman Finkelstein's response and answer that question. My, 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 res question. my response. My response is exactly the same one I gave you the very first time I met you, Pierce. There were atrocities. Yeah, who the fuck has $10,000 in Gaza to purchase a head, by the way? I don't know what the fuck that's about. Large atrocities that occurred on October 7th. I think it's indisputable. You then asked me, would you consider it terrorism? I then replied to you, I think atrocities denote terrorism. However, I said I take the same attitude towards the perpetrators of those atrocities as, I, as the abolitionists in the United States took towards the Nat Turner Rebellion. Nat Turner? So you justify vote. them, so you praise them, so you Allow glorify them, you honor them. That's Pierre, the Pierre, reality. Pierre, Pierre. Shut up, bitch. Let him finish. Pierce, can I finish? Yeah. He's can cooking. Finish? Yeah. Uh, Nat Turner and the Slave Revolt committed horrible atrocities. The ab abolitionists said horrible things happened, but they never condemned no, Nat Turner. No, they don't happen. They what are they perpetrated what they by did people. Was, You're justifying they, what they did was, Finkelstein, Allow me to finish. this is the lowest point Pierce, you've ever gotten to, and you've gotten to low points, but this is the lowest point you've gotten to, comparing these rapists. Bro, trust me, if there's another thing that Alan Dershowitz is an expert in, it's low points, okay? My man has a fucking entire career filled to the brim with low points. Uh, OJ, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, being on the Lolita Express, uh, advocating to, I mean, allegedly murdering his uh, wife, uh, <laughs> advocating to lower the age of consent, uh, advocating to lower the age of consent from a constitutional argument. So... I don't know what the fuck he's talking about here. Low points. This is your low point, bro. You have debased yourself professionally for years. And he's actually been, he's actually been rewarded handsomely for it too. And these murders well, I think let him, I think Alan, Alan, let him finish, the lowest point in your history. Let him finish what he's trying to say. Sure. Thank okay, you. Let me have By the way, word. Matt Turner's rebellion. Okay. In Matt Turner's rebellion, they committed horrible atrocities, including beheading babies. That's a fact. However, the and you're justifying that. They did and you're not, justifying that. They did not. Please, Pierce, can you please tell him? I think stop. let him finish the point he's making, and then, then you respond. Okay. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much. However, the abolitionists did not condemn the perpetrators. The abolitionists kept saying, "We told you so. We told you so. We told you so." If you treat people like that, what happened with the slave revolt inevitably would happen. And I say, if you lock two million people in a concentration camp for twenty years half of whom are children who were born into that concentration camp, don't react with shock and dismay and disbelief and indignation at what happened on October 7th. I have well, spent I the last react. 20 I, years, I have spent the last 20 years of my life studying what's been done to the people lying. of Gaza. And each time I reread what I wrote, I am more firm than ever before. I will not condemn those people, even as I acknowledge that massive, unspeakable atrocities occurred on October 7th. Okay, Alan Dershowitz, you'll find Let me have my last point. Norman Finkelstein, you would not condemn the Nazis, Hitler, Goebbels, and Goering, because they too went through suffering after the end of the First World War. They too tried to justify what they did as inevitable because of the inflation, because of living under terrible conditions. They inevitably voted for Adolf Hitler. They inevitably built gas chambers. They inevitably built concentration camps. And you, Norman Finkelstein, who claim your parents are Holocaust survivors, you, Norman Finkelstein, by your logic, would justify every single one of the six billion Jews who were murdered because 
The Germans who did it don't deserve condemnation because they were victims of the Versailles Treaty at the end of the World War I. That's the situation you're in, Norman Finkelstein. It's despicable. Okay. Uh, well, we, well, we started, uh, I think, in a reasonable show. I hope that Pierce doesn't fucking end it there. Come on, bro. Pierce is like, all right, good take. <laughs> Moving on. And we ended in a place where the final word is despicable, which is a shame. But I understand that passions run high. I think you both argued your case extremely eloquently and with great uh, verve. And I personally have sat and I've learned a lot, which is what I hope to do with these, with these debates. So thank you both very much indeed for joining me. Professor uh, Finkelstein, Professor... He said, bro, you would have defended the Nazis. It's like, bro, you're defending the Nazis right now. Sweatshirt just came in very comfy. Let's go. Poggers. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Piers. Thank, thank you. you, Piers. As always, you were very fair. I respect it, and I feel obliged to acknowledge it. I appreciate that. I try to be. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. I agree. You. I agree. Uh, BBC News has confirmed a ceasefire. Yeah, let's move on to some real ceasefires that have happened. Okay. J. Cole, who is now.